and welcome to this episode of the Curiosity Q podcast, where I'm joined with Natalie Jameson uh, from The Hero Works. And I met Natalie because we're both uh, business mentors for Tech Manchester. And Natalie is basically what I would call a power connector because since meeting Natalie, I have met so many more um, absolutely incredible people. So I am hugely grateful for all of those introductions. Um, so Natalie, tell us a little bit more about um, yourself, your background and the Hero Works. Uh, it's great to be here today and uh, nice and early on a Friday morning. Um, We'll soon get used to this with children. So uh, this is middle of the day for me. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be on this podcast. And well done you for getting it, because actually what we will tell people is we made a bet um, <laughs> at the event a little while ago. And uh, Charlie pledged to get this podcast up and out the ground um, and before a, a couple of what the date, the date was, but you, but you did it. Um, and the, um, the forfeit was, um, that you would let your partner name the baby. <laughs> I, stupid idea. Yeah. I had some really great names as well. Uh, but uh, let's just say for the record, it's quite good that you've managed to do this. Yes. <laughs> for, for the little baby sake coming along. But, uh, yeah. So, um, I'm, um, I guess, uh, take you back from um, where I started the Hero Works just before the inspiration came from. I've been in the financial services industry for 25 odd years. And uh, in um, 2008, when I was expecting my little girl, um, the credit crunch had kind of kicked in big style. And there was, um, there was, a, there was obviously, there was a lot of stress and, um, you know, a lot of worrying things happening in that industry and also for customers of that industry and it was getting harder and harder to kind of align with what was going on so do you know what i thought hey here it's time for a change um my husband's business partner and um, best friend from a long time um was a dentist and uh he decided to um try, they, they, they thought of lots of different ideas but they actually came up with an idea to put dental surgeries inside of um, sainsbury so it was coming out of the financial services industry into the healthcare industry, which was certainly a lot more point. And at the time, um, I don't know if you remember, but there were lots of people that couldn't get dental appointments. Um, the national health was really struggling to kind of meet demand. And so they come up with this idea to have a, um, a sort of private healthcare model, but that was at an affordable rate in a, in a supermarket. So anyway, left completely no idea how dental businesses work um and you know no experience in it i've done um, my training in business management and all of that sort of thing so i thought that i knew um how businesses work i wrote a really great business plan and a pitch and off we went um it worked but not because of that business plan the business plan did not get used at all uh, we scrambled our way through we ended up um building um the business to sort of six practices um and in that time, I was, it was really great because for me, it was able to have some time out with my baby. Uh, so I obviously helped them at the front end. But being the kind of person I was, I was a bit bored as well. So I decided to go off and do, uh, while we were building it, do um, a second degree. So I went off and did um, interior architecture degree and really focused on sustainable technologies, on heritage buildings. And I just love, I've always wanted to be creative. I don't know how anybody else's parents are um, kind of in the same vein as mine, but, you know, it was a bit like, mm, I don't know, design it isn't really a thing. And, uh, you know, doing something artistically creative wasn't very practical. So I was swayed away from it, but I, I found my way back to something creative and, and pragmatic, I guess. Um, and uh, I did a number of different projects. I worked um, on retrofitting um, some sustainable technologies on the Manchester Art Gallery, Help them to do some big doors and that was a big thing because that's it's a heritage heritage building so the amount of research and everything that had to go into that so i learned a ton of stuff around um design and the design process and human centered design and sustainability and heritage and all of those sorts of things i did a few other projects um and then we finally i ended up doing these projects and i'm still not really ticking all the boxes for me, I was, there was something missing. So I had all of this experience as kind of a 
you know, mergers and acquisitions, funder and big deals and all this stuff. And then I was doing the creative and I thought that would be my thing. I was like, that's not really it. I don't know what it is. It's still something missing. So when we sold the business, sold it to Google Healthcare in 2013, um, I was like, right, okay. Um, they didn't need me. I, I, my, my, my involvement was at the beginning. And I've now kind of opened my eyes to this kind of creative thing. I was like, mm. I don't want to go back and work in an architectural practice. And, um, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't really doing it for me. So I was like, well, I'll go back to um, finance. So I went back to finance and I went back to doing um, sort of acquisitions lending. And um, what was apparent to me, uh, so when I'd been out, I learned all this stuff about technology and I'd become a 3D designer and the design process and how we put the customer at the heart of everything. And we learn about, you know, all, all of the sorts of behavioral economics and all this. Before we designed the end product, I'd gone back into finance and I was like, still doing things in the same way. They're really, you know, when they come to innovate, if you like, it's in an echo chamber. Um, and I, I, I tried, um, I was on, and you know, with, with this kind of open um, view of the world around how can design can inform, um, you know, business and, and parts and services. I kept putting my hand up for all these workshops and, and, <laughs> and you know, things like that. Oh, like, I'll help but then getting incredibly frustrated because we kept going back to the same old process. So we would get either consultants to come in and they would take a view of our, our and re-engineer what we already had mostly. We would take a small voice of the customer sample, which normally um, involved asking some of our most happiest clients who really didn't need us. So therefore they never challenged the model or, you know, ask us to come outside of our model. So they would give us great feedback. We'd be like, well, they love us. And then we'd go on and build something that was just incrementally different to what we already, <laughs> what we already had, um, spending a lot of money. Um, and anyway, so I kept trying to re-engineer my job to position us to, to do things in this new way. And anyway, I tried for a few years, I thought, this is, this is still not my thing. I don't know what it is. But this isn't it. So I tried. I worked for ABN. Um, I worked for Shawbrook, and uh, and then latterly, I, I ended up um, one of my old bosses from RBS um, back in the day, um, way before we started the Dental Bay, um, was heading up a team at Siemens Financial Services, and he wanted me to kind of work for him for, for a while, and he approached me, and I was like, oh, I'm a bit bored here, and I still didn't have it clear in my head what I wanted to do. Um, so I went, yeah, but I pitched him this idea of this job. I was like, well, I, you know, so I think really financial services is in a, is in a, is in a stagnant period. We've got a lot of permanent non-borrowers there. At the same time, we have this kind of fintech, um, you know, emerging market coming up, eating our lunch and making it easier uh, with much less hoops to jump over to get capital. So you could go on an app and you could get that. Whereas if you dealt with one of us or the banks, it was like, can you jump through this hoop backwards, upside down and all these things. I like people, we just, we, we haven't got the same proposition anymore. The only thing we can do is go to the market with a, a really cheap price. And I was like, that's not me. I'm, you know, I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. So it's like, how about we take the whole Siemens um, kind of, um, ecos like the family that we have. So we've, we're a big engineering business. We've got um, we've got Next Forty Seven, which is like its own kind of VC. We've got um, digital factories. We've got all these things. How about? And I've I've worked done quite a few deals in mergers and acquisitions in the food and beverage um, sector. So it's like I like that sector, and I think it's got big challenges around sustainability and regulation, and 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 we import fifty percent, and we've got Brexit, and we've got all these things. Why don't we position ourselves as the go-to, find and fund, you know, place to be for food and beverage manufacturing in the UK? Because we need our we need our help. So we love the idea, and they always do when they're coming up. It's <laughs> And then you get in there and then um, through no fault of their own, they've got very entrenched people and entrenched processes that just don't lend themselves to an agile way of changing the way you go to market. Or um, So um, I, I spent about a year trying to build up um, us as this kind of key position of it with this key position of influence in that market. 
but you know it would take so we wrote a white paper around the the, um the business case and the uh, return on investment for industry 4.0 and and i we wrote it in i think we joined in this january we wrote it in like this february and it got approved in about the october or the sunday <laughs> Standard, yeah. yeah, pretty normal. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, it's really hard. So people have worked there for 26 years and they're trying to move from, you know, the factory floor to the boardroom, but still doing the same thing. So anyway, I like, I think they're going to do amazing, but my, I'm too impatient and, you know, so I need to come out. But one of the things I found when I was in there was that, you know, getting closer to this technology and working with the digital factory teams, was as there was this whole kind of, um, I guess the second, getting closer to the, you know, industry 4.0. And, you know, we all learn about it in high school, don't we, about the industrial revolution and how we, um, people really struggle to adapt to that. But they had years, they had like 10, 20 years to do that. Now with Moore's Law, it's like things, people don't have time to adapt. Mm-hmm. And I could see that there was this real disparity between those who were doing the technology and creating the technology and informing the design of that technology and the data set that we're getting it from was just a smaller, it was very small. And I was like, we, we don't see any women there. We don't see really any, uh, any, any diversity at all um, in that space. So I was like, I don't know, maybe this could be my thing. So I decided to do a little bit of research. I've always done that. So whenever I wanted to get a promotion or anything, I would um, kind of, um, I don't know, study to step up, I guess, if you want. I'd go off and I want to know the, the stats, stats and the data behind it. So I, just, I wrote a white paper um, to, to, I guess, to get it clear in my own head, but also, uh, you know, being a designer, that's what you want to do. You do research-informed design. So I, I did my research, wrote, it, I wrote a white paper called The um, with the future of women in work um, and widening the digital divide. And that was everything I needed to kind of click, get clear in my head what, what I needed to do. So I was like, well, it needs an intervention. And, I, and my, you know, when I first decided to do something, I wanted to really move away from the financial services industry as you do. Oh, it's really not for me. It's not, you know, I, I don't think there's anything there for me. And I was like, well, that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, really. I thought, 25 years experience doing this. I, I know the problems that they have sort of attracting and retaining and positioning women in, in um, you know, positions of, you know, returners and all that in positions of influence. I beam one, I know what the problems are. Um, so in terms of the way you design work, uh, but I also know in terms of, you know, what we're training and developing um, that talent to do is really not positioning us to take up those positions or to have a strong influence in those conversations so um i was like right well i'm probably i'm probably quite well placed to do that i know what this i have the skills of the future now so i you know i kind of learned this technology um, and and i'm I'm open-minded when it comes to learning new technology Uh, i have this design problem solving skill which is you know more and more businesses a client um are calling out for but i also get in a very deep level, what they're talk, what they're faced with on an operational basis, on a day-to-day basis. So I'm like, maybe I, maybe I could do something. So I decided to put together this program. So the program is um, called Future Leaders, and it's a six-step, 12-month program. So we got like, we've thrown a number of interventions at this, but the, the core program is this. So it's getting together women across eight subsectors of the financial and professional services industry. So these are um, sort of sectors that I used to work with. So um, in there you have both um, banking, you would have law, you would have accounting, private, private, private equity, wealth management, all of those. And the idea is that we bring together four women from each of those subsets, a, ma- a maximum of four, um, and then we bring them together to do uh, kind of look across the value chain and um, get a really deep, insightful level of kind of understanding of the customer's journey and pain points across so the. Yes, absolutely. But we've never done this really. And, um, and I certainly know not across the whole value chain. We, we maybe have bolts on a fintech or something. 
help them to look at it, but we, we've never looked at it. So from our point of view, um, as a customer of that market, it wouldn't be great if they understood not just what we bought from the bank and what we bought from our accountant and what we bought from our lawyer and our wealth manager, but they understood the whole thing. So that's the first thing is understanding that. And then from that, they go back to their individual employers and they say, here's, we've got this insight now for innovation. And we take on a project, which is aligned to this sort of thing is, is really trying to get that sense of purpose back into work is we're aligning our projects to the UN global goals as well. So they'll take one of the 17 um, that's most aligned with the, you know, the kind of, um, genuine um, purpose of that business and some maybe have other projects going on and then they work to create a new product or a service or a working practice for customers or even for talent because you know, talent is the biggest problem that they are facing um, as an industry. And then they work through this sort of six step process. So it's finding a line of purpose to the UN Global Goals, so that's the first one. Unlimit your moonshot mindset. So this is where we need to get out of our own way as women and you know that sort of self-limiting belief that we have. Um, and then it's think digital. So that's around the digital um, kind of prototyping and understanding the tech that we need that's shaping, shaping the world. Um, and then unlimited creativity and innovation, and that's the design thinking process and business modeling. Um, and then reaching social influence, so that's all around positioning yourself as the go-to person, also you know, elevating these women to advocate on behalf of the brand. Um, so you know, like yourself, you get your social media assets up to date, position yourself out there, tell people, but we're also helping them to um, to, to author books and to write um, pod, um, write um, blogs and you know blogs and all of those sorts of things really get themselves out there and then finally it's extending that values and productivity and that type of thing so that's the full incubator if you like and then they walk away with um, a digital prototype or some kind of product or service at the um, kind of prototype stage. But then um, we also, my, my business partners and I also now um, are able to develop the technology for them as well. So that's the kind of, that's it really. So um, yeah, that's um, sort of what we're up to now in the world. I suppose we're throwing that that's the main program, um, but we're also throwing lots of other things at it. So um, we're starting a book club based on that model so that women can go through um, with um, mentored by authors as well. So we'll pick um, the kind of, uh, we'll curate the book, the books to in line with the future model so that they can just go through the book club and by the end of it, so we read together, we create actions together in that kind of peer sort of way. And then we discuss how that's worked as well. So that book club's starting soon. Um, we do talks, we do lunches, you know, all of those things. So. Yeah. Um, but all with the main purpose of kind of powering these, you know, future advisors, lenders, investors to, to turn around the, the economy and support businesses in the, in the diverse and equal way. And what I absolutely love about this is that you're kind of bringing together a real community of people that are aligned, wanting to do, um, you know, have a similar impact. Because uh, I think, you know, we've spoken about this before is that, you know, you do a course, you read a book, but unless you've actually got support on implementing what it is that you're learning, or, you know, you've got people that you can bounce ideas across and you can say, you know what, I read this or I learned this, but I'm not quite sure this fits into my model or the thing that yeah. I'm trying to achieve. Um, and just having that interaction and having that challenge and that support is so, so important, mm. um, especially the world that we're living in today where people seem to think that just by reading lots of books, it makes you know everything or have the answers yeah. to, to every challenge. I think that was that was the thing for me. I mean, this is my look, my bookshelf. You can see here, <laughs> it's full of them. And yeah, I've read some of them. I've I've read less of them than some of them. Um, but I go on and I go, right, that's amazing. And then I carry on with my day, and you know, and I implement some of them, but mostly, um, you know, I guess through osmosis, not through a proactive kind yeah. of like we agree, like okay, this is what we're tackling this time in the book, and. Um, I'm going to go away and implement that action and getting some kind of accountability on it. But um, yeah, so we're just wanted, we're trying to, to, to do lots of different interventions, but all with that kind of main aim in 
you know, that we, we position as women to design lives for themselves so that we, you know, our, our, God, it, I call it womenomics, really, and that this is one of my made up, made up words, but it, <laughs> uh, you know, the lifetime earning trajectory of a woman is pretty, screwed, it's pretty screwed, actually. So we have to take time out to have the children. We physically have to do that because we cannot be in the office giving birth, right? So we have to, <laughs> even if you're in America and you're literally back at work in two months, that's crazy. Your body takes a long time to recover. Your psychological kind of fit for the world um, takes time to recover. And this is all science back. So we're not on our game. And that's not our fault. But you know, it's just part of part of nature. Um, and what that means is, and because we live longer as well, the time we get, to, um, so we have shorter working lives. If somebody's had to be at home or whatever, and it generally is the woman, and that's changing, thankfully. It's my husband, you know, we're juggling that now. Um, but mostly it's the woman who has to be at home. So if the child from, um, throws up in nursery, you have to be at home for two days. Um, those are the sorts of things where, you you know, you can't go away on, take those, take those assignments, take those high-profile, um, you know, away um, international assignments then slowly your position in the corporate world or even in business, you know, you fall behind. And what's happening is we are ending up at the end of our careers um, and the end of into retirement with an average pension pot of 36K compared to a man of 170. So there are our financial wellness, not only just our, you know, our contribution to creating a more equitable society, but we just, yeah, we have, we have, so with technology and with these skills, we can go up, we can do side businesses, we can create these, you know, worlds for ourselves that, you know, give us flexibility and financial, you know, financial wellness and fulfillment throughout our and there's so, there's so much, op- you know, so many opportunities out there for people, you know, because you know, if you've got, um, you know, a parent, not even a woman that wants to take a period of time out of work to yeah. raise a child or have a child, um, which is absolutely fine, but yeah. then, you know, having systems and, and opportunities in place. So, it, you know, actually returning back to work isn't such a steep process yeah. you know, to allow people that, you know, the flexibility, you know, if you don't want kids, that's fine. You can kind of progress and do what it is that you want yeah. to do. If you do want to have kids that, and just go straight back into work again, that's fine, but you've got the support in order yeah. to do that and the flexibility. And then if you want to take time out, then again, that's fine as well. But yeah. you know, it's that having those support systems and understanding where you can go to get that support and that help rather yeah. than things that you've got to do it all on your own. Absolutely. Yeah. Or you know, forcing you back into something and then um, self back into a position and just struggling the whole time, you know. I don't know if anybody's watched this, but this one of my favorite programs on, on TV at the moment is called um, Working Moms. It's on Netflix. Watch it because it is <laughs> so true to life. And, you know, they just have four or five moms in this. And they're just charting the story back after work. One woman's, um, she's like a really high-powered um, marketing exec. And she's trying to just be the same as she was before she went off. And, you know, they're, 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 they're like, we've got to get ready for this big pitch. They're all sat around, the, you know, a board table and they're eating Chinese and the time, time's, clock, you know, clocking on. And she'd had a video from um, her, her nanny um, with her baby saying the first word, but she was still trying to be all, you know, so she missed her first child's first word. And, you know, that's, that's tough. It is tough. But, you know, she was still there being, you know, power woman. And um, one of the guys in the meeting just, just said, um, so, um, so has your nanny called your, um, has your baby called your nanny uh, mommy yet? And she just burst into tears in, in the meeting. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard. And these are real struggles. But does, you know, I, th- I think that there needs to be like a real big, I think she really need to be there doing that. Or could she not have gone home down bedtime and then check back in with Ted? She, you know, I'm going to put my baby to bed and then I'm going to come back on and I'll, I'll hook up with you after the baby's in bed. Or, you know, you, can do that. you don't have to be there, that presenteeism, I think. And this is where I think technology really presents us with this incredible opportunity, probably the biggest opportunity of our lifetime. Mm the century to, to get equality and to get parity but for all people yeah not just parents and, yeah. and 
I think for me though, equality sometimes is that education because you know the yeah. guy that's like, oh yeah, um, trying to make her feel guilty or yeah. um, make her feel bad about being at work when a kid's yeah. at home with a nanny. You know, yeah. if that's her choice and she's happy with that situation, then who yeah. the hell is he to? to I know. And say that's, well, that's I, the wrong I, thing to I, do. I, that exact thing. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any names. He's not a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I was in a. Um, I, I was in a, in a, in a one-to-one um, at the end of the year, you know, that kind of appraisal time. And um, yeah, my husband just lost his mom and we were, we were struggling as a family. You know, we, we were having, as you do, you try and get through these times however you can. So uh, he, he was really struggling. So I was, I was doing most of, the, most of the stuff at home and making sure life just carried on, which, you know, giving him a chance to grieve, et cetera. And so it was tough and I'm in sales. So, you know, it, it, when you're in sales, you need to be on your game, um, but to be on your game, you have, everything has to be going right. And sometimes it doesn't, you know? Um, so I was struggling and I'd also just been off the back of, um, I'd have five managers, five managers. They just kept getting rid of people. It was like, I don't think it was me. And maybe it was, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. To, don't have her as your employee. Um, she'll get rid of you. But um, no, I had this one-to-one at the end of it. And the guy was basically like, he, he, I can't believe he said this, but he went, um, so, you know, just seems so disorganized. He said, um, are you, um, I mean, how are things at home? You know, how old's your daughter? And I was like, well, she's eight. And he was like, oh, um, yeah, that time doesn't last very long, you know. Um, yeah, you know, maybe she, maybe maybe this isn't the right place for you. Maybe you should be, you know, home home with your daughter. <laughs> daughter. <gasps> I just like choking by the tears, thinking, I can't believe you just said that to me. But I might say, like, well, do you have kids? And he was like, Yeah, yeah, my my wife's at home with them. And I was like, I think we definitely we definitely need to encourage in the workplace both. In- <laughs> you know, support without judgment because, you know, you never know what else is going on, but just that actually being there to support and just say, look, you know, how can I help you rather than, um, oh, I'm going to presume that things are falling apart or this is not the right place for you. That, yeah, it just drives me absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're really struggling to get talent. In fact, the financial services industry, um, and there was a report done by a company called Corn Ferry, and they said the there's a looming 2030 talent gap, which is going to cost uh, 1.3 trillion of lost output if, and there's something like 10 million open, you know, unfilled positions for that globally. So we need to hold on to talent in any way that we can. And that's agile, that's full time, that's contract, that's, you know, talent, our talent pool looks very, very different. And when we have, um, and coming at it from a, let's be human and sort of look after each other in the family sense is, is asking, you know, is everything okay? Do you need extra support? What can we do to rally around? Not to, oh, you seem a bit unorganized. Maybe you should be at home with your child. <laughs> I love my career. And, I, you know, I took a lot of pride in my work. And actually, I, he, what he did was do me a favor because I came back and I was top of the sales team by the end of that quarter. But then I left. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. I was like, I'm going to prove to you and then I'm going, yeah. I'm going to have another baby, but this time it's going to be a business. I'm yeah. going to grow it and I'm going to have a significant impact. So, yeah. 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 So, uh, but yeah, I agree. I think um, we are in very interesting times. We're at, um, at a pivot point now where if we can get this right and use technology and agile working processes and, and untap all of that kind of, you know, innovation that's held in this, um, in that, in that talent pool, mm. uh, we can do something really special. And it don't, won't matter about Brexit and it won't matter about the geographical boundaries because, you know, innovation will, will just will overcome those, those issues. Yeah. I think it's important to have people within larger organizations. I mean, the majority of my experience has all been with much smaller businesses. So, yeah. you know, you can work much more um, it, with agile processes. You can work faster and more nimbly, which yeah. for me, and I think for, for you as well, yeah. is that really plays into our personality of, you know, sort of acting fast, moving with the times and keeping up with technology. Yeah. Um, but I did, uh, you know, so I spent a period of time working in public sector, working for the yeah. NHS, 
But for me, that was a really exciting time because we, um, I was looking after a, a set of projects that we had 40 different projects across the East Midlands yeah. that were um, um, basically they were all funded to address the challenge of how can we reduce costs within the NHS because that was a big challenge and yeah. also increase care. And it was a great initiative and yeah. it's not quite happening so much anymore, but when it was happening, it was um, it was amazing. And those projects had the support in order to kind of make things happen, to innovate, to think outside of the box and to yeah. think differently. And I think more larger organizations um, from lots of people that I've spoken to who work in them, you know, need that autonomy um, and also just to be, to let their curiosity loose. Um, you know, cause especially, uh, you know, you talking about your journey is prime example of asking those important questions saying you know this isn't playing into um what it is that i'm brilliant at this isn't yeah. this doesn't feel right this doesn't sit right what else could i do how could i incorporate it into yeah. my life and it's brilliant to hear um from from you to sort of hear your journey about kind of like where you started and, and where you are at the moment it's very exciting yeah i think you i think you hit the nail on the head that um that i think we need to reframe failure and curiosity and take a we're talking in the um in the financial services and in, in the sort of capital um markets now about patient capital and that patient capital um ethos needs to be brought into business so you know ideas innovation entrepreneurship but you, you don't just come out with the first idea and it's amazing and so we we have the the whole um I think the whole, what do you call it, the, um, the kind of competency-based frameworks that we have in organizations now um, train us and create behaviors around um, short-term outcomes and being scared to be curious and scared to experiment because we need to, at the end of the quarter, hit our metrics, financial and non-financial, and proven the evidence around those things. So I think I would, I, I'm almost like advocating for um, like a fifth, not, not have a fifth quadrant, but you know what I mean? Like, so it was, you know, a, a fifth section on the thing, which is around innovation and experimentation and trying out new things and using your talent. And so Google and places like that, they have 20% time. And, you know, and I think that's the kind of thing that we need. And, and it's so important for organizations. Now we look at the financial services industry again and the law industry, um, so Apple have just announced their credit card. We've got Amazon coming in to the market. The it's it's boundaryless now, and you know you've got um, law tech where you've got AI that's predicting contract outcomes and doing due diligence and all of the things that we do as a did do. Um, you know credit assessments. All of these things are being automated. Anything that can be you know an algorithm can come around it will be done and done better and faster and quicker by um ai automation um you know and and but that's great because that frees us up to do what is human you know to be creative to have empathy to you know to make mistakes and learn from them and you know look at einstein he did not he wasn't a great student he fell out of he kind of kicked up, not either failed out of one school and he didn't come up with his, you know, his theories overnight. They were, a, you know, a long slog of making mistakes. And mm. yeah, I think that's where we need to just open our eyes and- uh, I think we, we as a society kind of dwell on failure a little bit too much and, and kind of taught that it's bad to make mistakes or, you know, do whatever you can to avoid making mistakes. I know that that was kind of a big part of my um, school education um, to sort of like, you know, oh, if you know you're going to make a mistake, don't even try. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, well, you know, that's the best way to learn. Um, yeah. And you learn much faster yeah. when you make mistakes. Oh my God. Yeah, like so you said, the innovation, you know, you don't come up with this great idea, start to implement it. And then all of a sudden it's a no. massive success, you know, no, <laughs> nice if it was. <laughs> No, but, 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 and you know what? Those mistakes are the ones that you learn. They stick with you, right? So yeah. you need to think, mm, um, yeah, that was, I missed a massive step, but you're not going to miss that again. Or you'll like accidentally come up against something amazing. And that's, I know I have to say, I like to say that all the things that I've ever done that good were on purpose, but they so were not. And, you know, <laughs> um, 
we um but but that whole like and this is the other thing i think that we need to do is in the way the model is set up is you know that we have these individual hero makers um of in people who are awesome at their own thing and playing into their strengths i don't try and do everything i certainly am all for collective intelligence so um you know not just because it's it's safer it's more fun and you just get so many more ideas and you move so much quicker as well so working together learning together you know falling over together and getting back up together is absolutely the way forward so yeah so that perfectly brings me on to my next question which is uh, kind of you know because i know that we're, we're running out of time a little bit here but um you know how important has your network been in um getting your business up and running and sort of getting you to the point where you are today absolutely um, you know i say um i am now um we have a team of 12 um so the board um is myself we've got genie um who's a coo and they run a couple of software businesses and paul and and annie um, so, uh, firstly, to take an idea from concept, I left Siemens um, at the end of January, the end of um, December. And so, to take an idea from concept, this has been bubbling around for years, but to take it from concept to the point where we're actually now running a program um, in less than, a, you know, like a quarter, um, is the only way you can do that is through community. And, and keeping in contact with community, growing that community. I mean, the book club is a, is, is a great way where we can be able to create this kind of learning community across the globe, which is the idea is to create these little hubs in um, centers, but also connect on a global basis. You can only do that through community. And, you know, these technology platforms like LinkedIn, um, absolutely um they are the lifeblood of growth, I think, and um, certainly um, anybody who's thinking of starting a business or growing their practice or growing, you know, even their revenue stream in a big corporate is, you know, get yourself positioned in a great community, learn from them, grow together with them. Amazing advice. Uh, so just a final piece of advice, like, you know, for anybody, like, rather, what advice do you have for anybody listening that has um, had an idea, has, yeah. you know, sort of got this sort of like burning desire to solve a big problem, yeah. but isn't quite sure either how to get it off the ground or yeah. doesn't quite know how to sort of yeah. like leave the situation that, there are, that they're in right now and then kind of like make that jump. Do you have any well, advice for people listening? Oh, absolutely. I would say the first thing that you need to do is ask your customers what it is that if you, if you think... <laughs> Are they are are you actually solving a problem that they believe exists? <laughs> Firstly, um, so before you do anything, I was like, create a prototype. And when I say create a prototype, create a brochure, create an online page. You know, put it out there. It doesn't even have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be an app. It doesn't have to be anything. Literally, set up a Facebook page, set up a LinkedIn page. Ask people if this is a problem that they have, and if what you're presenting as a proposal will solve that problem simple just do that before you spend any money <laughs> I'm that that because I know. like a, uh you know sort of um build the plane as you're learning how to fly it yes. um you know I, I did that with my first because uh, I, I really want to get more and more into the education space yeah. um so my first program was all about helping people uh, with the business development strategy using LinkedIn yeah. as that tool. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I sold it before I'd even created it because I yeah. didn't want to create something that people don't want, don't benefit from, yeah. um, or don't use. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Always, put, always put the customer at the heart of it. You need to understand, you, you think you're still solving a problem. You might actually be solving a different problem that you think you're solving. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, before you do anything, ask, <laughs> ask them. <laughs> Yes. yes ask your customers because, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you can't build a business without customers no so, you know Definitely. Build, don't don't build it and hope they will come which is the old way of doing things and we and work on ways to um to be um hard to copy and the best way to be hard to copy is to collaborate and collectively put your ip together with other businesses and you are very very difficult to model and, and don't worry about putting something out there and thinking oh somebody's going to copy it you know nobody's going to try and copy you until you're driving a ferrari so don't worry about that you know <laughs> just, just get it just get it out there ship it ship it yeah, yeah. plagiarism is the best form of flattery yeah, so <laughs> it absolutely is yes yes feel free to copy me anybody or try yeah <laughs> 
yeah. love it oh well it's been amazing to have you on this podcast oh, okay, we could talk for hours yeah, okay. um, about yeah. various different topics so just to wrap up um how can our listeners um keep in contact with you get in touch with you yeah, yeah. find out more Absolutely. So um, we've, we're just creating um, a scorecard, actually, which is are you future fit for you know the, the, the digital economy? And that's for HR directors of financial and, and professional services companies. And the idea is that they take this test and it tests them around attracting, retaining, um, retooling, and then creating revenue from your talent stream. Um, and that will give them kind of a score. Um, and we want you to just email us at hi at the Hero Works for a copy of that. And then we can have a discover- discovery session. And also um, we have the, the program, which is starting probably in September. And we're starting to take applications for that. Um, so, yeah, just email us at hi at the Hero Works or link in with me probably is the best thing. Um, so that's um, we'll put the links in this presumably. But it's not at Hero Works. Or I have a LinkedIn. Um, how is the LinkedIn thing? Does it go LinkedIn, Nat, the Hero Works, or something like that? But anyway, we'll put it in there. But <laughs> we or, will include all of the links in the show notes, which are yeah. on my website, which is yeah. charliewyman.com forward slash podcast. Um, everything will be kept together, so don't worry. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Natalie. It's been great to speak to you and catch Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. We'll Chat. see you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Ciao.